Okay, so today we're going to talk about glaciers and deserts. So we're talking about the two extremes here in temperature. First, I want to talk a little bit about glaciers and ice, how they actually can shape the landscape, physically moving sediment and water around, but also too the interplay between glacial ice and our climate system, how one drives the other and vice versa. So okay, what is a glacier? A glacier is a slow flowing sheet of permanent ice. And so by permanent here, what I mean is lasts for multiple years, not something that's just going to be there for one year, like a snowfall or even just a couple of months. We wanna talk about a sheet of permanent ice lasting for multiple years. And it also is usually moving down slope or in an outward direction. And I'll explain what that means in a second. But a glacier is then a slow flowing sheet of moving ice. We have two different types of glaciers. The smaller type is called a mountain or an alpine glacier. And you can imagine these would be things found, say for example, in the Alps. These are glaciers, sheets of moving ice that are concentrated towards the tops or peaks of mountains. Here's a good example of a picture of some mountain glaciers. They're relatively small, meaning they don't cover a huge amount of uh, land surface. But as this picture shows, they are moving down slope. It almost looks like a river of ice. If you look at the graphic at the bottom of this slide, you'll notice that the elevation where you can find glaciers changes whether you're at the poles or closer to the equator. At the North and South Pole, temperatures essentially at the surface or even at the tops of mountains is extremely cold. So glaciers can even be found at an elevation close to sea level. As you move from the poles toward the equator, however, average temperatures tend to increase significantly. There's a lot of sunlight being absorbed by the equator. So of course, in order to get cold enough temperatures to have glaciers, you have to go to higher elevations. So at the equator, you may need to go up a mountain several kilometers before you reach a mountain glacier. But this is also here to remind me that I have to tell you, even at the equator, you can have mountain glaciers. Tanzania has a great example of this. The mountain in Tanzania, Kilimanjaro, has a large glacier sitting on top, even though it's at about two degrees south of the equator. Continental glaciers are the other type of glaciers, and they're much larger than mountain or alpine glaciers. These have some sort of continental landmass underneath them, but they cover a very wide geographic area. So think of the Greenland ice sheet or the East Antarctic or West Antarctic ice sheets. The Greenland ice sheet is shown here on the left. And on the right, you can see a transect You'll notice that there's the red line cutting through the map there from X to Y. Underneath the map, you'll see X to Y, there's a cross section of the Antarctic ice sheet. It's a type of continental glacier, but it varies significantly in, in thickness. The West Antarctic ice sheet is much thinner than the East Antarctic. And the two ice sheets are separated by the Trans-Antarctic Mountains. So our two types of glaciers, mountain or alpine glaciers, and continental glaciers are both slow-moving sheets of ice. One is just smaller and found at the tops of mountains. The other is much larger and is sitting on top of a continental landmass. So now that we know what a glacier is and what types of glaciers exist, how do we form a glacier? Well, you can think about our recipe. We need to have significant snowfall, right? The snowfall is what's going to pack together in order to make ice. We also need to have temperatures that are cold enough, even throughout the year, that the snow doesn't melt away in the summertime. Remember, we wanna have a permanent sheet of ice and we wanna keep adding snow and ice to it every winter. So the summers have to be cold enough so that we don't melt all of the snowfall from the winter. We also need to make sure that the ice is accumulating on a very gentle slope or on a flat-lying area with no slope. 
Why do you think this is important? Remember, if you accumulate snow or ice on a steep slope, what's going to happen to it? Usually it will move through an avalanche. So you won't get a buildup of snow to create a glacier. Okay, so each year that you get more and more snow buildup, the snow is going to compact as it's buried by more and more snow, and the compacted snow will eventually form ice. If you notice the diagram here, you see the two kids playing at the top. That would be just the snow during a regular snowfall event. But if you bored down into a glacier, underneath that snowpack you would find what's called fern. Fern is a type of granular snow, but under the pressure of all the snow sitting on top of it, the air starts to get squeezed out and the snow starts to recrystallize and become granules. If we work further and further down into our glacier, notice as we go down to about 250 meters, we're now getting into firm snow and fine-grained ice. Some of these glaciers may take 10,000 years to get 250 meters thick, but as you get further and further down in the glacier, the snow is being compacted, the air is being squeezed out, and the snowflakes begin to recrystallize into each other to make ice. As you get further and further down towards the bottom, maybe 2,000 meters thick, of course this is going to be a very large, probably a continental type glacier, you're going to get coarse grained ice at the bottom, and notice how we've re reduced the amount of air significantly. We've gone from about 90% air in our snowfall down to only about 20% air or less. So we've really compacted the snow down to make uh, a dense ice that forms the basis of our glacier. Ice tends to flow by two main processes. One, the bottom of the glacier that is in contact with the bedrock often is melted because of the pressure of the ice squeezing onto the bedrock. That melted ice at the bottom creates a thin veneer of water. And that thin package of water acts as a lubricant. And so the glacier will move by what we call basal sliding. The bottom of the glacier actually moves along its base, lubricated by this thin film of water. Glaciers can also deform, however, just based on internal flow. And you could imagine, just like how glass starts to kind of flow over time, remember we talked about how the windows in old churches start to look a little bit warped, you can also have internal flow in a glacier as well. And you can look at the diagram on the bottom here and see the crystallized shapes in the before picture. But as that glacier is pulled by gravity down slope, those crystals just start to deform and become sheared. That would just be a type of internal flow or shearing of our glacier. We've probably all seen movies where you've seen these big cracks in glaciers and ice sheets. Those cracks are called crevasses, and they form at the top of the glacier because there's low pressure at the surface, and the ice is able to just crack open, creating those big open crevasses. Further down in the glacier, however, the ice is under pressure, and so the change or movement of the ice at lower depths tends to be more ductile. Ductile deformation just means that things are flowing or moving kind of in a plastic or a smearing type way. So ice in a glacier doesn't actually move at the same velocity everywhere throughout the glacier. Believe it or not, the middle of the glacier actually will move faster than the edges. And the reason for that is because the edges are actually in contact with the bedrock. And so the edges of the glacier experience friction and move slower. So the fastest part of the glacier is actually going to be right in the middle near the top. Um, and that's because essentially uh, you don't have any friction from the sides of the bed or the valley where the, the ice is moving. And so you'll get the fastest flow right in the middle. Uh, geologists actually figured that out by essentially going to and hiking out onto glaciers and installing sets of uh, straight drill pipes 
down into the ice. And what they would do is then let the ice flow and move for long periods of time. And what they did is when they came back to find out where those pipes had moved to, where those drills had moved to, the ones on the edges only moved a little bit. The ones in the middle moved quite a bit farther and then others actually weren't uh, hadn't moved as far on the on the edges. And so what happens is, is that that middle part of the glacier will actually move the fastest. And they were able to see that um, by using these uh, these drill holes. What they also noticed, too, is that drill holes that were put in initially were these long straight pipes. But when they actually went back and tried to pull those drill holes out again and take those pipes, they noticed that the pipes had actually been bent. That's because of this idea that you get brittle movement up at the top, right? There's the cracking of the crevasses. But at the bottom parts of the glacier, you actually get kind of more plastic deformation here. And so it was the plastic deformation that actually bent some of these pipes in the drill holes at the bottoms of the glacier. So this just kind of proved to us that there is a combination of both kind of this basal sliding, right? Just the sliding of the base along here, the plastic deformation at depth, as well as the brittle deformation on the upper parts of the glacier. Now that's how, uh, excuse me, mountain glaciers move. Continental glaciers move in a slightly different manner. Continental glaciers aren't confined to a valley. Instead, they're sitting on top of continental crust. So they kind of accumulate snow and build outwards in all directions. Kind of like if you had a bottle of honey or corn syrup and you squeezed it out onto the middle of a desk. If you kept adding more and more honey to the middle of your pile, your pile of honey on your desk would just start to grow outwards in all directions. You can think of the Antarctic Glacier or the Greenland Ice Sheet as a similar phenomena. If you keep adding snow and ice to the middle of the glacier, it will eventually grow outwards in all directions. Glaciers can actually be set up into two main zones, and it has to do with the zones of where you're either gaining or losing snow or ice. The uppermost part of a glacier up here, at least shown in this picture, is called the zone of accumulation. This is where essentially you are accumulating or adding more and more snow. There is also then a zone of loss that is usually towards the edge of the glacier. And we call this not only the zone of loss, but also the zone of ablation. Ablation is essentially a way that we can describe the loss of ice or snow, usually either through melting or through the process of sublimation, which is the act of ice going um, uh, directly into a vapor phase and going into the atmosphere. So the zone of accumulation is the uppermost part of the glacier where you are getting more and more snow added. Notice how that when we add more and more snow to this glacier here, the previous deposit of snow immediately gets covered by the next successive layer of snow. So if you were a, 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 a rock, a pebble sitting on the snow right here, the first thing that would happen is that the next snowfall would cover you, the next snowfall over that would cover you even more. And so you would actually move in a general trajectory down into the glacier this way. What then tends to happen is that gravity begins to pull the glacier down slope. So you'll notice that the flow trajectories, the, the flow lines of each of these um, glaciers here, shows that at first the initial movement is down into the glacial ice, but then they turn and start to move down slope due to gravity. In the zone of ablation, because this is where we're losing snow, a lot of material actually is getting removed from the topmost part of the glacier. So the trajectory, the flow lines, start to come back up towards the surface of the glacier within the zone of ablation. So what that sets up essentially is if I erase all of my horrendous lines that I've now drawn all over here, it has set up a flow trajectory beneath a glacier that is initially down underneath the glacier, then moving down slope, but then arched back up towards the surface of the glacier once you hit the zone of ablation. This is important to remember that 
even when a glacier is receding or melting or getting smaller, the glacier will continuously be moving down slope. Notice that in this diagram, I'm showing glacial advance, right, or the glacier is actually getting bigger in the uppermost panel and glacial retreat in the lowermost panel. As you're adding more and more snow to your glacier, you're continuously adding more and more weight to the uppermost part. And so what will happen is that now the glacier will move down slope and eventually advance. That means that we've now essentially added more snow to the zone of accumulation. And usually due to colder temperatures, we are losing or we're having less ablation on the front part of the glacier. So we're losing less, if that makes sense. So if you add more snow and don't lose as much, you'll get glacial advance or growth. In a situation where potentially you're now warmer here, you're adding less snow, which means that now you're getting more loss or more ablation. And so the front part of the glacier is actually going to retreat or get smaller. It's important, however, to remember that even if the front part of the glacier is retreating or melting back, the glacier is still moving down slope. You are just essentially adding less snow up at the top and you are losing more at the base. But when we say that a glacier is retreating, what we mean is that the glacier is still moving down slope. You are just melting more off the front than you are off the zone of accumulation. So as the icebergs get down towards the bottoms of their valleys, sometimes they will eventually reach lakes or potentially even the ocean. Because ice floats on water, we can actually lose ice through the uh, calving of icebergs, and those icebergs will float, and sometimes they can float a significant distance away from the edge of the glacier. Remember that every time a glacier rolls over the land surface, it's going to be picking up a whole lot of sediment and material. So those icebergs will also be chock full of not only ice, but also sediment and continental material. So as those icebergs raft out into the middle of a lake or into the middle of the ocean, eventually the ice will melt and they will drop all of their sediment. These are called drop stones. Notice in the picture at the bottom, there's a core of deep sea sediments. And most of the core is just made of mud, but these very large blocks sitting in the middle of the core, those are what we call drop stones. It makes sense that in the middle of the ocean, we should see lots of fine grain, muddy sediments, but it doesn't make a whole lot of sense as to why we should get big cobbles like this. Really, the only way to get very large particles like this into the deep ocean is to have them raft out on icebergs. This gives them another name, IRD, ice rafted debris. As glaciers move across the land surface, they tend to pick up a whole bunch of sediment and debris. And so you can imagine if there is now ice that also now has a bunch of rock and debris in it, that, that ice is very abrasive. So as glaciers roll over the land surface, they kind of act like huge sheets of sandpaper. Um, so what happens is that they will polish or grind down into the rock that is beneath them. So these pictures here are showing you the effects of that erosion that is imparted by the glacier as it rolls over the exposed land surface. The picture in the top left here is supposed to show you that this young girl is sliding down some glacially polished rocks. So as the glacier rolled over these rocks, the, the grit and the, the debris in that uh, coarse ice was enough to actually grind down and polish that rock so that the surface now has a high shine and is also very slippery and she's able to slide down it. You can also see in the bottom two pictures that you can erode and uh, leave behind very distinctive marks when you have a glacier that rolls over um, open or exposed rock. 
For example, there are things that are created called chatter marks. And the chatter marks are these little things I'm showing right here, right? These little kind of U-shaped or V-shaped features. A chatter mark is formed when a glacier is moving over uh, exposed bedrock. And the constant freezing and thawing of the ice um, sitting on top of that bedrock causes the bedrock to crack in these little kind of, you know, chevron shaped features. And as the ice keeps moving, the little bit of rock gets kind of picked up or plucked off and uh, carried away by the glacier, leaving behind these V shaped uh, indentions that are called chatter marks. You can also see in the diagram on the bottom right, the picture on the bottom right here, this piece of polished rock, if you look closely, has some kind of straight lines carved into it like this. Those are called striations. These are also uh, formed by glaciers eroding and literally scratching long grooves into the rock um, as the glacier rolls over that rock. What's cool about striations, and if you look really closely, you can actually see that there's some striations on this picture over here too. Striations will often tell you the direction that the glacier moved. So the glacier actually moves parallel to the uh, long axis of the striations. So it's kind of neat. You can actually figure out the direction of flow of the glacier just by looking at the long axis of either um, striations or these kind of long linear erosive features formed as glaciers uh, erode and polish the rocks that they move over. Sometimes glaciers actually don't just affect small bits of rock like the pictures you just saw. They'll actually create whole different landforms. Um, so, for example, the picture shown in the upper left here, this is something called a roche moutonne, uh, which is actually, I think, um, a, a French word for, it shows kind of like a, a crouching sheep or something like that, essentially a, kind of looks like a small uh, sheep-like structure sitting on the landscape. So what tends to happen is you get these kind of landforms where the rock has kind of a steep side on one side and then a gradual side down the other side, and that is from the glacier kind of rolling over large bits of exposed rock and giving it this kind of round-backed shape uh, that uh, glacial geologists have called Rauch Moutonnais. You will also see, too, things called fjords, right? These kind of glacial valleys that uh, where the glacier is no longer there in the valley, they're now filled with water. But of course, in uh, Norway and in the, the Scandinavian countries, these glacial valleys that no longer hold the glaciers, but now are holding the meltwater, um, those are the fjord type topographies that we see associated in glacial landscapes. So the cool thing about uh, looking at glacial landscapes like this is we actually, even if the glaciers aren't there anymore, you can, as a geologist, you can look at that landscape and say sometime in geologic history, there have been glaciers coming through this area because glaciers and their immense erosive ability can take V-shaped valleys. You remember we talked about V-shaped valleys when we talked about rivers, right? Up near the mountains, rivers usually have valleys that are very sharp V-shapes, right? They're steep sided. Um, that's because they're being cut down by rivers. So if the rivers are then replaced by glaciers, because of the erosive power of glaciers, the glaciers tend to make U-shaped valleys. And so what was once a V-shaped valley that just had a river in it has now been carved into a U-shaped valley by the glaciers that came through that same river valley. If the ice melts completely, and now we're up at time equals three, the glaciers have completely receded. We're back to having these little rivers coming through these valleys. But what you'll notice is that now there are very tiny rivers in very large U-shaped valleys. That tells us that the area was once glaciated because rivers, very small rivers, don't make big U-shaped valleys. So the U-shaped valleys tell us that there was glacial ice there at one point and the glaciers have now receded. What you might also notice are things called hanging valleys, rivers that are actually kind of coming down a valley and then all of a sudden there's a steep drop off and the valley is truncated by another one. 
Okay, that's called a hanging valley. You can see what that was, is that was a valley that was once filled with ice that then got truncated by another ice sheet. And now if you look at it after the ice sheets have receded, it just essentially looks like a river that flows to a waterfall. That can tell you too, that hanging valley can tell you that you had glacial ice uh, definitely modifying the landscape. You might also see the remnants of where different ice sheets carved the tops of mountains. You can see things called cirques and arets. A cirque is up here, right? This is this kind of circular shaped valley that had a glacier sitting in it at one point. Or you might see an arete. An arete is essentially a ridge between where two glaciers diverged from each other. You may also see that the very tip of a mountain might be considered a horn because a horn is where multiple um, glacial valleys began and then came down in multiple different directions. You know, kind of like what they call the Matterhorn. That would be the topmost part of the mountain where multiple glaciers began and then went down their separate valleys. So when glaciers move, they are not only moving ice, but we've talked about that they're also moving a lot of sediment. So the sediment that is being brought by glaciers uh, tends to get pushed to the sides and to the front of the glaciers, and it makes something that we call a moraine. Okay, so a moraine is the sediment material that the ice is trying to move. And depending on where the lump of sediment is, we can give it a different name. For example, if you are pushing uh, sediment and rock to the sides of the glacier, you would call that a lateral moraine, right? The lateral here meaning to the side. If you have two glaciers coming together, here we actually have two different glaciers that are kind of blending to become one, you may then get a moraine that is in the middle of two different glaciers. We call that a medial moraine, right? A medial meaning the middle moraine. You may also notice too that uh, the glacier will end up put, pushing a whole bunch of sediment out towards the front of it. When it does that, it almost is a, uh, a, a sheet of ice that is behaving kind of like a bulldozer. The lump of sediment that is collected in a pile at the front of a glacier is called the end moraine. So the end moraine essentially is this kind of, you know, pushed up mound of sediment right here in the front or what we call the toe of the glacier. The end moraine not only is made from this kind of bulldozing action, right, literally the ice just pushing all of this uh, sediment into a pile in front of it, but remember too, any ice that is either in the glacier or on the glacier will eventually, due to sublimation, it will end up at the top and can then kind of avalanche off the front here and add to that pile. So that is what helps to make an end moraine. Here's a great example of uh, glaciers that are coming together, and I'm gonna erase all my drawings here, but you'll notice that here are several different glaciers coming together, right? Here's one, here's another, and then here's another one coming in from the side. My red arrows here are showing you beautiful examples of moraines. These are both medial moraines because they are essentially showing where one glacier is now connected to another and then connected to yet another over here. Good examples there of medial moraines. And if once again, I'll erase all my drawings here, you can see in this picture, this is a lateral moraine, right? The one on the side. But since this glacier is moving in this direction, this lump of sediment in the front, this is what we would consider an end moraine. When a glacier is moving, oftentimes it will, it will expand and stop, maybe expand a little bit more and stop or recede a little bit and then advance again. Each time the glacier will make an end moraine. When a glacier has reached its furthest extent, essentially when the glacier has moved the farthest it's going to move, it creates the last 
end moraine that it will ever form, and we call that the terminal moraine. In the northeast part of the U.S., all these yellow deposits here are showing the terminal moraine from the Laurentide ice sheet, which formed during the last glacial maximum, about 20,000 years ago. We call this the terminal moraine because the Laurentide ice sheet grew from Canada in several different steps, moving its way down into the U.S. But the yellow deposits shown on this map are the farthest extent that that glacier ever grew. Those deposits are then called the terminal moraine. The two red X's here show you Ronkonkoma and Montauk in Long Island, and I'll show you some of the deposits that can be seen there on Long Island. The X in the middle of Long Island there on Ronkonkoma shows all these very large boulders, which seem to be out of place, especially on Long Island. All of these boulders were carried to Long Island by the ice sheet. As the ice sheet melted, they were dropped off, very similar to the drop stones that we talked about being carried out by icebergs into the middle part of the ocean. Oftentimes you can tell glacial drop stones because they don't look like any of the rocks in the area. When that's the case, we call them glacial erratics. An erratic is something that just seems different or out of place. So for example, in Ronkonkoma, these drop stones here don't look like any of the local bedrock. So we know that they are glacial erratics. If you go all the way out to the end of Long Island, out to Montauk Point, and you look at the beaches there, the beaches are not sandy, they're extremely rocky. The rocks and, and material that are found on Montauk Beach are essentially made of glacial deposits called till. Till is very poorly sorted. These are all different grain sizes. And it's just the stuff that the glacier picked up and bulldozed down to Long Island and then dropped off in the terminal moraine when the glacier started to melt and recede. So there are different types of glacial sediments that we can form. There's a picture of a geologist for scale right here next to some more glacial till, and you notice that it's a lot of fine grained material, but a lot of big chunks as well. That's because a glacier doesn't really care what it picks up. It's going to pick up everything in its path. The picture on the right here, where the people are standing in front of what looks just like a cliff of sand, this material here is what we call luss. Luss is the fine grained material that is blown around in front of a glacier. You can imagine that cold air sinks over a glacier and warm air will rise over the non-glacial parts of the land surface. This creates winds that are extremely strong that are blowing off the glaciers. Those winds blowing off the glaciers pick up a lot of sand and dust that can be traveled, that can be carried, excuse me, hundreds and hundreds of miles away. When they deposit, those wind-blown glacial sediments are called luss. Lastly, we can often form lakes sitting right in the middle of, uh, right in front of glaciers. You can imagine that, of course, the glacier is going to press down on the land surface. And so as the glacier melts, that depression will fill in with water. As the depression filled with water turns large, becomes larger and larger, it becomes a lake. And those lake sediments often will become laminated or very finely layered. And we call those varves. Varves form in glacial lakes, and you can see here that they seem to be a collection of different colors, a light layer and a dark layer, and then another light layer and a dark layer that are maybe just a couple millimeters thick. Those varves, those couples of a light layer and a dark layer, form every one year. So varve sediments are very helpful in figuring out how old a glacial lake is. You can core the sediments and count how many pairs of light layers and dark layers you have, knowing that each pair forms in one year. If you've ever flown over upstate New York or certain parts of New England, you might notice that there is a strange landscape up there where it is a bunch of very small 
uh, circular or kind of elongate lakes. And there's there's literally hundreds of them. I mean, Minnesota, I think, is actually even called the land of a thousand lakes. The reason for this is because this area used to be covered by extremely thick ice sheets called the Laurentide Ice Sheet. As the ice sheet uh, moved over the landscape, it carved out little pockets and little grooves, but also then when the ice sheet finally began to melt about 18,000 years ago, little icebergs actually started to break off the front of that Laurentide ice sheet. Now, ice is genuinely heavy, and so what tends to happen is that those little icebergs that were sitting on the land surface pressed down on the land, made a little indention, and then as the iceberg melted, it filled that indention with water. What this did is it made essentially something called a kettle lake. And so upstate New York and Minnesota are just filled with these small little circular or elongate lakes, for example, like the Finger Lakes. And these are kettle lakes that were formed during the recession of the uh, Laurentide ice sheet from the last glacial maximum. <clears throat> The other thing you can do is as uh, you can notice that uh, an area was once glacially covered. If you look for remnants of what used to be um, the outwash or essentially the meltwater channels that were distributing sediment and water when the glacier was there. What will happen is, is that uh, underneath the glacial ice, there will be a zone where there is water at the bottom of the glacier. And so usually a glacier will have a small tunnel where the outwash, right, the melting water can come out into the front part of the glacier onto a plane that we call the outwash plane. Notice how this is a lot of, of sediment, right, from all the moraine material. And so the um, type of river that forms on the outwash plain is usually a very typical braided river. And it's a braided river because there's a ton of very coarse sediment that the glacier just kind of plowed up in front of it. And so the river water, the kind of the uh, outwash water, can't really establish a very big channel. It has to just work through all of that coarse sediment. So you might notice that even after the glaciers are gone, you might see the remnants of the outwash plain, all these beautiful braided river channels that were once helping to uh, remove water from these tunnels underneath the glaciers. And you can maybe see the remnants of that on the outwash plain, or you might actually even see these little features on the land surface that were underneath the glacier that are called eskers. Eskers are just the remnants, essentially, of the um, meltwater channels that were underneath the glacier uh, when it was still there. Here's a great picture of Alaska. There's a mountain glacier coming down from the right side of the image here. And you can see where the glacier is melting. There's an outwash plain and a beautiful example of a braided stream moving all of that sediment around. So now let's talk a little bit not only about glaciers, but also about the effects of glaciers on climate and vice versa, how climate can affect the growth or the melting of glaciers. So what causes an ice age, a period of time in geologic history when uh, large ice sheets were forming over higher latitudes? You can imagine that if we don't receive as much energy from the sun as we do now, that can, that can create global cooling and this happened about 650 million years ago. The sun was not as strong as it is now, and so the amount of energy that we received from the sun was significantly less. It was much easier, therefore, to get globally cool temperatures and have an ice age. You can also disrupt ocean circulation, either by melting glaciers or by having the continents arranged in a certain way. You can trigger global cooling this has happened many times in geologic history. And for those of you who've seen the movie The Day After Tomorrow, or who still need to do your movie project and want to watch The Day After Tomorrow, this is the premise of that movie. We stop the circulation of the oceans, and by stopping the um, Gulf Stream, we disrupt 
warm water being brought up to higher latitudes, and this can trigger an ice age. You also know that CO2 is a greenhouse gas. So when CO2 is high in the atmosphere, temperatures stay warm. However, if CO2 amounts in the atmosphere start to decrease, for example, this happened in the Devonian when plants evolved and started to suck a whole lot of CO2 out of the atmosphere, having lower amounts of CO2 in the atmosphere reduces global temperatures and can trigger an ice age. We also talked a little bit too about how you can have shorter term cold periods when you block out the sun's radiation after large volcanic eruptions and aerosols block sunlight. So along the same lines of the first bullet point on the previous slide, we can actually trigger ice ages by changing the amount of heat that we receive from the sun. And it doesn't have to do with the age of the sun or anything like that. It just has to do with three main cycles that change the way that the earth is oriented with respect to the sun. Now, these were actually uh, identified by a Serbian geologist named uh, Mulatin Milankovic. So here's the name Milankovic. And so we named the three cycles that he um, identified after him. What this says is that changes in the shape of the Earth's orbit or changes in the, sh in the orientation of the Earth with respect to the sun can change the amount of radiation that we get and therefore can make us warmer or colder. The first cycle that Milankovitch identified is called the eccentricity cycle. In a, actually, it's due to the pull on the Earth of large Jovian planets such as Jupiter and Saturn, but every 100,000 years or so, the Earth's orbit changes from very circular to very elliptical and back again. This essentially is the eccentricity cycle. So you can imagine if winter is at this point uh, in Earth's orbit, you'll have a relatively warm winter. But if winter is at this point in the Earth's orbit, when Earth's orbit is very um, elliptical, you will get seasons where the winters are much, much colder. Now remember, it takes 100,000 years for us to go from circular to elliptical and back to circular. So there will be many, many, many years where you will have winters that are significantly colder. So that can trigger ice ages on a 100,000 year cycle. The second Milankovitch cycle is called obliquity. This essentially just has to do with the Earth being on a tilted rotational axis, but we don't just stay on one rotational, uh, one uh, tilted angle. The rotational axis of the planet actually changes from about 24 and a half degrees to about 22 and a half degrees. So our angle of tilt is sometimes not as dramatic. So you can imagine if you are the sun right over here, if you are the sun and we are tilted at 22 and a half degrees, lots of the northern hemisphere and the high latitudes will get a good amount of sunshine from the sun. However, if we are rocked backwards, right away from the sun, what you'll notice is that we will not get as much sunlight hitting the northern poles what that can do is trigger ice ages as well. And the obliquity cycle is on the order of every 40,000 years. So every 40,000 years, we go from 24 and a half to 22 and a half, and then back to 24 and a half degrees. So we can create glaciers due to the amount of sunlight that is able to get up into the uh, North and South poles due to the tilt of the Earth's rotational axis. The last one that we have is called precession. Precession has to do with the wobble. Okay, precession is the third one. That has to do with essentially the wobble of Earth along its rotational axis. If you've ever spun a top or spun a dreidel and you notice that when it starts to slow down, it kind of starts to wobble before it falls over, the Earth is actually doing the same thing. 
And so while it is on its rotational axis, it also kind of wobbles a little bit back and forth on its rotational axis. Sometimes we point towards the North Star and sometimes we point towards the star Vega during this precession cycle and the cycle takes about 20,000 years. The precession cycle changes seasonality quite a bit, right? So it changes the seasonality um, of, of whether uh, we have uh, northern latitudes having very warm summers or relatively cool summers, because once again, it helps us be either tilted towards or tilted away from the sun during the times that we have uh, winters and summers. So Milankovitch cycles are actually really important. And even though they work on very different scales, here's eccentricity, right? Showing you that uh, at zero, right, years, you have a very elliptical orbit. Then you've got a circular orbit. And now at 100,000 years, you're back to your elliptical orbit. Whether you're in the obliquity cycle, and here they're listing it as 41,000 years, that's okay. Showing again that we have a very shallow uh, tilt more of a tilt and back again to a shallow tilt every 40,000 years. And then here's the precession cycle down here, and it is roughly 19 to 20,000 years long. I've averaged it and told you you could remember it as a 20,000 year cycle. Here's the right the wobble of the axis. So away from the sun, towards the sun, away from the sun, towards the sun. And here's every 20,000 years. Just remember that these three cycles are working together at all times. And so sometimes they actually work to kind of either negate each other or actually make each other um, more dramatic. They might even emphasize each other. If you'd like a really quick tutorial on Milankovitch cycles, I would definitely recommend that you go check out this website. It's kind of neat and it has some cool animations that shows you how these cycles can actually play into each other and how they can help to create ice ages on planet Earth. Okay, so what are the consequences of glaciation, but also more importantly, during times of global warming, what are the consequences of deglaciation or melting of glaciers? We know that polar ice is melting. If you look at pictures of the North Pole, here's 1979 and 2003. In the 2003 picture, you can see the red line was the extent in 1979. And you can see how much ice has actually been melting during that short period. The picture on the bottom shows the Greenland Continental Glacier. And the area that is in white is the area where you still had glacial cover in 2005. The areas that are in red and pink are the amounts that have melted since about 1992. So we know that polar ice is melting. But the concern is that it's not just at the poles. Here's Oregon's Mount Hood, shown in 1985 at the top, and shown in the same month in 2002 at the bottom. So this is not a seasonal issue here. It's not that one was taken in December and the other in August. These are taken in the same season, but just several years apart. Here's another example. This is the Warren Glacier in Canada. Notice the pictures showing the glacial extent in 1912, then 1928, and then again in 2001. Notice that you can actually see sediment in the bottom of the valley in 2001. That glacier has melted and receded significantly. The diagram on the right actually shows you the recession of that glacier by color, and that color is keyed to what year. Kilimanjaro, the ice cap sitting on top of Tanzania's largest mountain, has lost about 82% of its area since about 1912. Kilimanjaro sits just a few degrees below the equator. So the diagram on the left shows you how many square kilometers of Kilimanjaro were covered by ice around 1910, and how much has been lost as we approach 2020. In fact, the projections suggest that if you want to uh, hike Kilimanjaro and see the snow caps at the top, you might want to do it before 2020. Just to show a more dramatic case here, this is a, a glacier uh, in Bolivia. Outlined in red is the extent of that glacier in 1940, 
and outlined in yellow is the extent of that glacier between 2010 and 2015. So a significant reduction in the amount of ice on this glacier. So what do you think happens to, for example, sea level when glaciers all over the globe are starting to melt? Do you think sea level is going to go up or down? If you said sea level is going to go up, you're absolutely right. Notice in the graph on the right here that sea level at around 20 or 18,000 years ago was significantly lower than today. The reason for that is because a lot of seawater was locked up on land in very large glaciers. However, as those glaciers melted from about 18,000 years to present, all that meltwater has entered into the oceans, causing sea level to rise to, his, to its present levels. If you look at the uh, picture of, the, of North America on the left here, you can see that if all ice melted, the, all ice sitting on continents right now, Antarctica, Greenland, and all of the smaller mountain glaciers, if all of that ice melted, you can see all of the areas of the coastal North America that would now be underwater. For example, New York City. There would be about 70 meters of sea level rise if all continental ice melted. So you should buy your oceanfront property in Memphis right now. But let's think about the socioeconomic effects of this. What if the glacial snowmelt is the main water supply for your area? I see this a lot in Tanzania. The Kilimanjaro ice sheet, seasonal meltwater, is the source of water for many of the African villages around that, uh, that mountain. Essentially, the ice cover on Kilimanjaro has declined by over 80% since 1912, and the entire ice sheet may be gone by 2020. So you can imagine, it's a little worrisome as to where these places are going to get their fresh water. Lastly, we can also think about a very large scale geographic response to what happens when glaciers move across the landscape, but also what happens when they melt. Ice is pretty heavy in terms of when we say big, thick continental glaciers. You can imagine that if you have a very large continental glacier sitting on the land surface, it will actually act as a weight and press the land surface down. We call this subsidence. 20,000 years ago, we had an extremely thick glacier sitting over the northeast. And so the land surface of the northeast was subsided, was pressed down by all of the weight of that glacier sitting on top of it. Since about 20,000 years ago, that Laurentide ice sheet has been melting. What do you think happens to the land surface once that heavy weight is removed? That land surface starts to bounce back and rise back up, and we call this glacial rebound. In fact, this is happening in the Northeast right now. As the glaciers have receded, we're still seeing the land surface in the Northeast rise up just a little bit, due to glacial rebound. Okay, so you made it through my 30 minute discussion about glaciers. So now let's warm up a little bit and talk about deserts. So I wanna switch gears here a little bit and talk to you about deserts. Uh, I've actually been very fortunate. Uh, I do a lot of my research in arid and semi-arid areas. So I have had the, um, the opportunity to work in several different deserts around the world, um, Australia, Africa, um, the US, et cetera. So uh, I will be showing you some pictures of some of the deserts that I've worked in. So for example, these are some springbok here uh, in the Namibian desert. Um, but we wanna think first of all too about how do we form deserts and what are the characteristics of deserts? And uh, while we often think of deserts as these kind of hot, superheated, you know, dry areas, this slide reminds me to tell you about my experiences in the Namib Desert, which were um, very unique. Um, the Namib Desert is actually not hot. It is actually quite cool and quite cold at times. So um, deserts being hot is not actually one of the characteristics. It is mostly that deserts just need to be dry. One of the things that helps those deserts be dry is the fact that we create um, significant wind uh, 
uh, in most deserts. And that wind is set up by changes in temperature and that therefore creates changes in atmospheric pressure. So we wanna talk about wind and air currents. If you can imagine that you are sitting on land, the sun heats up the surface um, and then that surface, as it gets hot, it heats up the air that is sitting on top of it. So the um, air that then gets warmed by the kind of radiant heat coming off the land, that warm air tends to rise. Remember, this is very similar to convection, right? So hot air rises, and so here's our warm air going up, and whenever we have warm air rising on the land, that creates low pressure. So whenever you hear the meteorologists talking about, you know, there's a low pressure system sitting over North Carolina, that's what they're talking about here is that you've got kind of a rising air mass and because the air is rising, moving air from the surface up into the atmosphere, that creates low pressure. As that hot air rises, it usually then cools and so eventually will start to fall back down and where air kind of falls back down, that will create high pressure. Okay, so high pressure is, uh, it happens where you've got now cooler air and it's usually sinking. Variations in pressure can actually now mean that if you have low pressure over the land and high pressure from cold air sinking down over the ocean, that means you can now generate movement from the areas of high pressure towards the areas of low pressure and that creates wind. Okay, so the variations in the air pressure push the air at the ground level and they push it from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure and that makes wind. Okay, so pop quiz. Where do you think the planet receives the most amount of uh, direct solar radiation? Well, if you said the equator, then you would be right. So absolutely, right? We get a lot of energy from the sun. This is my little sun, right? Here's my sun. Lots of energy from the sun happening right at the equator. So because there is a lot of energy from the sun bombarding the equator, that means that the land at the equator is relatively warm. So the air above the equator is also warmed and that creates a current in the atmosphere of rising air and low pressure. So where there is, you'll see here, right, warm air, these are my red arrows, warm air is rising in these areas and so that creates at the, at the Earth's surface low pressure because the two arrows are showing that the warm air is rising. Now that the air is in the atmosphere, what tends to happen is the air will cool down, right? And so the air starts to now move away from the equator and it will cool down and eventually it will start to sink. And so it will start to sink sometimes away from the equator, but will also then create zones of high pressure, right? Because where the colder, denser air sinks, that creates zones of high pressure. These zones, these kind of cells of rising and sinking air in the Earth's atmosphere are called the Hadley cells. There are several different Hadley cells, right, that are kind of set up around the Earth, but the one that we're looking at here is the one mainly set up around the equator. Sinking of uh, cold high pressure air and the rising of warm low pressure air also then creates the movement of air in the Earth's atmosphere to create wind. Wind is usually named by the direction from which it comes. So notice that you'll see right in here, these are called westerlies. That's because they move from the west to the east, right? They're moving in this direction. These guys up here are called polar easterlies. That's because they're moving from the east, right, towards the west. So just remember that you're always going to name wind by the direction it comes from, not the direction it's going towards.
There are also then several different sets of wind that happen around the globe due to their latitude. And I don't need you to remember all of these, but I just wanna show you that at the equator, you get a group of uh, winds where they are kind of coming in this direction and they are converging at the equator, uh, winds coming from different directions below the equator and wind coming from above the equator. This sets up what's called the ITCZ, the Intertropical Convergence Zone. And it's where land, ma uh, land masses, wind masses from the uh, Northern and Southern hemispheres start to collide. This is a very important zone because this is where the monsoons are generated. Okay, very important for places like Africa and India that are um, dependent on uh, tropical monsoons for the only rain that they will get throughout the entire years. As you go um, north and south of the equator, what you'll then notice is that here's our easterlies, right? Remember, because they are coming from the east, there's our westerlies, and then we get further up here into the polar easterlies. Both wind and water tend to erode or move sediment quite efficiently. But as you can imagine, water is more dense than wind or air. And so water is technically a better agent of erosion than wind. Even so, as you can see in this bottom right diagram, wind can pick up quite a bit of sediment and works very similarly to water where it can pick up, push or roll grains just like a water flow can. If you've ever been in a dust storm, you can see the power of wind erosion. When wind currents are carrying a whole bunch of sediment, you can imagine that they actually act like large sand blasters. So when wind wears down rocks, we often create what's called a venta fact. The venti part means wind, and you can think of it just like an artifact, but instead of an artifact being created by a human, a ventifact is created by wind erosion. You can see this boulder here on the left side has been pitted and polished by wind blowing huge amounts of sand over it. This has sandblasted the surface to make it nice and smooth. It's a great example of Wind can also erode large stacks of rock to create these funny little things called hoodoos. Hoodoos essentially are rocky masses that are uh, usually oddly shaped, but are created as wind wears away very weak layers and the more resistant layers stick out a little bit further. In areas like Nevada and Utah, wind pulls away a lot of the fine sediments and leaves a rocky veneer on top of the ground surface. It's much easier for wind to pick up very fine particles than it is for wind to pick up very coarse particles. And so the coarse particles get left behind and the fine particles get picked up by dust devils or windstorms and get removed. What tends to happen over time, more and more windstorms removing all the fine material, they leave behind all of the coarse rubble at the top. We call this desert pavement. This desert pavement essentially looks like a bunch of cobblestones at the top, and they didn't all form there. It just is that they have deflated to show this nice pebbly surface, because all the fine material in between them has been blown away by the wind. You might remember from when we were talking about rivers that as water moves over loose sediment, it can tend to make uh, little ripples or little um, ridges in the sand. Wind will do the same thing and it can actually cause sand particles to kind of get picked up by the wind, right? They'll get picked up by the wind. They'll kind of roll up the backside of these ridges and eventually they'll kind of avalanche down the front part of those ridges. This is the way in which wind moves a good amount of fine-grained sediment. So this wind is blowing in this direction here 
it's picking up these little sand grains on the back side and it's allowing them <clears throat> to kind of, uh, you know, leapfrog or jump up the back side and then they kind of get deposited on the front. So in this, uh, in this way, you can create either a sand ripple or a sand dune, depending on the size. Ripples are usually generally smaller and dunes are usually much, much bigger. So there, there is a net set of erosion back here, right? This is where the sand is picked up. So the sand is eroded on the backside. And then what tends to happen is the sand is then deposited on the front side where the air is relatively calm. So what tends to happen over time is you erode off the back side of the dune and you add or deposit onto the front side. And in this way, the dune or the ripple actually migrates in the direction of the wind flow. It's pretty neat. So dunes and ripples formed by uh, air movements move over time. And what you'll notice is that if I erase all this very quickly, if given enough time, what will happen is this will erode down and this new ripple will actually move out in this direction and you'll kind of see the slip face underneath of where the dune was prior to its movement. We can create a couple of different types of dunes too, depending on um, the type of sediment and also the direction of wind. Barkan dunes, the ones shown here in the upper left, are kind of horseshoe shaped. And the U of the horseshoe is facing the upwind direction. Essentially, the opening of the dune is facing downwind. In coastal environments, you can also get horseshoe shaped dunes, but the horseshoes face the other way. Notice picture C here, the parabolic dunes. In coastal areas where you get a little bit of vegetation, the vegetation anchors the edges of the dune, but the winds blowing on shore blow the horseshoe downstream. Sometimes you can also create long dune ridges. For example, as you can have transverse dunes, like the bottom left here, and transverse means essentially that the dune, the long axis of the dune, is perpendicular to the wind direction. Or you can have what are called longitudinal dunes, and that means that the long axis of the dune is in the same direction as the wind. Now don't laugh, I actually have had the opportunity to work in several, several different types of desert environments, so I figured I'd just show you a couple pictures of the deserts that I have known. We'll try to think about what deserts are based on some of the pictures here. You gotta love this picture. So deserts I have known, part one. This is where I did some field work in Namibia. This is the Namib Desert. And you might notice how I'm dressed. I'm not dressed in all of these clothes because it's warm and I'm worried about the sun. This was the coldest place I have ever worked in. I have multiple layers on, I have a hat on my head, pants and everything else, and I'm trying to get warm by wrapping this tarp around me. You can notice that the wind is certainly picking up this tarp significantly. But I show this picture because it's really important to remember, deserts are not always hot. Instead, deserts are always dry. This Namib desert picture is a good example of that. There were cold breezes and cold fogs surrounding us every day of field work. So deserts are certainly not always hot, but they are definitely dry. It's kind of neat to do field work in a desert actually. So this was my transportation vehicle when I was working in Namibia. So every morning I got to ride a four wheeler out to my field work. It was pretty neat. Uh, and yes, we did take them across the slip faces of many dunes where you're literally just heading straight down the front of a dune. Uh, that was slightly terrifying, so I hope I never have to do that again. Here's another example of uh, a desert that I worked in in Southern California. We were trenching the San Andreas Fault, looking for historic um, movements and earthquakes along the San Andreas. You can see in the back there's a couple of little pockets of what looks like little white sediments. Those are evaporative lake deposits. So even though this is relatively warm, it's just showing us too that this desert is extremely dry.
I did a lot of work in the Great Basin as well. So here's um, the Bonneville Salt Flats in Nevada. And while this is extremely dry, it was also unfortunately very hot. Temperatures, I stuck a meat thermometer in the Bonneville Salt Flats at about 10 o'clock in the morning and the highest temperature I was able to get was 111 degrees at 10 a.m. Uh, this is just a picture of me here coring a bunch of d dried up lake sediments. But you see in the foreground of this picture how the, the ground surface is all mud cracked. Shows that we're extremely dry um, and, and an arid region here. I've also done some work in the, des in the uh, Sahara Desert. Uh, I just don't have a picture of it. So here instead, um, here's a picture of the Sahara Desert at night. So okay, how would you classify deserts? If we were going to describe them, remember, we can't just say that they're always hot. Instead, a better definition of a desert is that they receive very little rainfall, less than 10 inches of rain per year. So you can imagine a ruler is 12 inches, right? Less than 10 inches of rain per year. Most of the deserts also have very little vegetation. But as the picture here shows, they can be hot or cold. I beg to differ that they show that the Namib desert here is hot. I can tell you definitely that is not always the case. But deserts do cover about 20% of the earth, and of course because they have very little rainfall and very little vegetation, there's very low populations associated with deserts. So what tends to create deserts? What conditions can create deserts? Well, even though deserts can be hot or cold, high temperatures, of course, can create uh, deserts. The reason for that is the higher the temperature, usually the more evaporation. The more evaporation you have, the drier you'll be. We already talked, too, about air pressure. Air pressure can cause intense evaporation as well. In the subtropical latitudes where the Hadley cells have sinking air that gets warmed back up, by sun rays at the equator, that warmed up air can hold a lot more moisture than cold air. And so that warmed up air sucks out ambient humidity with it and evaporates it up into the Hadley cell. So in the subtropical latitudes, you get events, inten ugh, excuse me, intense evaporation. When clouds or wind hit a, um, a high point, mountains or a high plateau, usually what happens is the clouds either increase in their elevation, they go up, or they cool off. Cold air can't hold as much moisture as warm air, and so when clouds hit mountains, they tend to rain. What that means though is that on the back sides of the mountains, all the rain has already rained out of the clouds, and there is a shadow behind the mountain range that gets very little rain. So topography can create deserts as well if you're in the rain shadow. You're behind the mountains and you get very little rain because the clouds drop all their rain in the mountains before they get to you. Well remember where is the rain coming from? Well the rain is most often coming from evaporation from the ocean. But all the while a cloud is moving onto land, it's going to be losing moisture as it rains across the landmass. So if you're in the middle of a continent, for example, the middle part of Australia, and you're very far from the ocean where water is evaporating to create clouds, your large distance from the ocean means that you're going to be extremely dry. Lastly, remember too, air circulation as those air masses move to higher latitudes and travel towards the poles, they're going to be losing moisture all along the way. And so the further you get towards the poles, usually the drier you're going to be, unless you have more evaporation. So lastly, we want to talk about desertification. Essentially, desertification is the development or expansion of deserts, usually due to human activity. So if deserts are dry and have low vegetation, we can think about what might cause that. The vegetation loss that leads to desertification can be due to things like stripping normal vegetation and planting crops, so farming, 
or loss of vegetation due to overgrazing of livestock. We also talked the other day too about soil deterioration, right? And soil erosion. Overcropping or overgrazing or even deforestation can all lead to soil deterioration. Once the soil deteriorates, it can no longer hold vegetation or support vegetation and therefore deserts are expanding because of the deterioration of soil. Even though this may not seem like a problem that's very close to home, it is a large problem in many other countries. And folks propose that it, about 30% of the world's arable land, that means land that can be used to grow crops or vegetation, will be rendered useless for agriculture, potentially in the next 20 years.